to talk about something a little different. Uh, I'm just curious to see a show of hands. Anyone have any experience with this platform called TELSA, transurethral ablation of the prostate? Very, very few. So I'll sort of, sort of let you know what it's about and uh, describe it a bit. Um, I have worked with the company Profound, uh, and I've been involved in some of their clinical trials, which we'll discuss as well. Um, there's only one company that makes the product. So TULSA, or transurethral ultrasound ablation of the prostate, it is a ablative therapy that destroys prostate tissue. It got a Canadian approval in 2016, FDA in 2019. Um, and then basically I'm going to talk about TULSA for prostate cancer specifically, although technically, you know, uh, high-intensity ultrasound can ablate tissue in general. We'll talk about some five-year outcomes from a big trial, real-world use, some focal therapy data, salvage data, randomized trials, and future directions. Um, so again, uh, an audience not familiar with this, this is a procedure where under general anesthesia, patients asleep, a urologist puts a, a, a transurethral applicator like a cystoscope into the urethra of the patient, just gonna drop it in. Um, they then puts a rectal cooling device, which you can see on the bottom of the screen here. Um, then you put the asleep patient into an MRI the MRI tells you where things are. Um, it can help you adjust the position of this applicator in the urethra, make sure the rectal balloon is in the right place. And then there's up to 10 parallel five millimeter thick sections that beam out waves of high intensity ultrasound from apex to base of the prostate. And then the unit actually rotates and distributes these in 360 degrees or 180 or how many degrees you want. Uh, and there's active cooling of the urethra and the rectum. So while you're heating the, whatever you want to say, out of the prostate, you are not heating technically the urethra and the rectum. And there's thermometry in the MRI telling you real time where the uh, temperature is being delivered. Uh, so this clinical trial, TACT, was a multi-center, single-arm, whole prostate cancer treatment trial. Again, this was uh, 115 men low and primarily intermediate risk, biopsy-proven cancer. Uh, this was fairly high volume patients with bilateral disease, most with five or more positive cores. Uh, and as I said, about two thirds intermediate risk. This was whole gland ablation. So we took, you know, imagine a chicken on a rotisserie that rotates 360. Well, the chicken is the patient doesn't rotate. It's actually the, the sticker in the middle that rotates 360 degrees and cools and heats the prostate, keeping the urethra and the rectum cool. We had one year and five year endpoints, which we'll go over. And this is collaborative, you know, across the Atlantic with uh, institutions there in the uh, Europe and in the US. Um, the company's Canadian based. Um, outcomes at one year, and this is, you know, I think important. Um, you had a biopsy at one year, 10 cores minimum. The prostate <laughs> at that time for patients had shrunk down to a median volume of about three cc's. So getting 10 needles into a three centimeter cubed area was, was, was tough, but I would say, if anything, we oversampled patients to make sure nothing was missed. Most ac agreed to the biopsy at one year. The negative biopsy rate was 65%. So that, you know, one could imagine that's, you, know, you have to tell patients, you know, we did what we thought was the entire prostate, cooked it, and 35 still had cancer, 35%. Um, so I don't think you can compete with radiation or surgery, you know, in that regard for cancer control. Um, you can see that, you know, while um, about 85% of men had the dark blue or the semi-dark blue, that's grade group two cancer or high volume grade group one, at the, end of, uh, at the end of study biopsy at 12 months, very few patients still had grade group two cancer or a large volume of gleason six, but overall, nevertheless, 35% still had some cancer on the biopsies, often, you know, less than 5% grade group one, but still present. And that's the pitfalls of trying to ablate an entire prostate with the minimally invasive ablative therapy. Um, so these are kind of five-year outcomes. It's a busy slide. I mean, the idea is, I think the salient thing to take home is one-third of men still had some prostate cancer and are still on surveillance for sure. And even the men who weren't, you have to keep an eye on and follow their PSAs because there's still a little bit of prostate tissue around the urethra. Uh, the five-year salvage treatment-free survival was 79%. So again, 21% or so had radiation or surgery afterwards. Um, what's dramatic and what kept me interested in this is that if you look at quality of life, 
Uh, you can see the continence curves on the top, uh, the potency curves at right in the middle. There were really, really very, very few patients that had side effects. Uh, I'm a surgeon and I talk about side effects a lot because although I cure most patients, you know, most also have, if not transient, I mean, if not forever, at least transient ED and urinary incontinence, and you really don't see this much. I mean, I know the curves seem to go down, but within a month, and certainly at the long term, very few impacts on, I mean, no one's really wearing diapers, and men are, you know, very, are regaining potency primarily because you can keep this ablation within the prostate. Um, the, the company has looked at the treatment failures, like the 35% who did not do well, and they've been pretty good about trying to figure out why and adapting the system and the software to control getting the heating to the nooks and crannies of the prostate that were not ablated. Um, um, one of the biggest things that they realized was that there's uh, acoustic shadowing within the prostate when there are prostate calcifications. And we all know who treat prostates, that's a lot of subtle, small calcifications really only seen on a, on a non-contrast CT, not on an MRI. Um, and if these are greater than three centimeters, sorry, three millimeters, they can cause shadowing of the beam because the beam emanates from the center of the prostate and you can see shadows. Um, other predictors of recurrence other than having calcifications, which now should exclude some men from having this, would be high PSAs uh, yeah, at one year. That suggests there's something brewing. Uh, or a visible lesion on a one-year MRI post-ablation. Uh, the, the image is B on the bottom right there. The yellow shows sort of the area that was cooked to what they call target temperature. Um, on the left, you can see sort of the red, and, and the yellow is uh, sort of the real-time stuff that's going on. And some areas are just getting shadowed at the periphery. You can see some blue where you're not getting enough temperature because of calcifications. Please. Um, I'll try to breeze through, catch up a little bit, but real world in the U.S. people are using this. It is a, is a big deal. You have to have a urologist, you have to have a radiologist, you have to have time in an MRI, you have to have an anesthesiologist, you have to have support from the company until you're up and running to get the software to merge with the MRI. And I know at least at Hopkins where I work, you know, they want to run their MRIs for diagnostics. They want to do, you know, 30 MRIs a day, and we can probably do three of these a day. So that's a problem reimbursement wise. Uh, but there is now a code, so hopefully things will move forward. Um, and I'd say the key point is about 80% of people doing Tulsa are doing it subtotally. We call that focal therapy or partial gland ablation. If you look at the bottom left of the slide, you'll see heating in, you know, the, you know, right lower quadrant, if you will, or a three-quarter stick sort of uh, going all the way around the prostate, but leaving one area un unablated. So there are a lot of ways you can do this uh, sonar sweep, so to speak. Um, and here's just sort of schematics of how you would do it. You would turn on the more distal, say, five or six elements and just sweep, and you'll get the more, you know, proximal um, basal parts of the prostate, for example. Or in the right image, you can just pick a quadrant and just destroy that quadrant and spare the nerve bundle on the other side, spare the prostate on the other side for what that's worth, and have really few to no side effects. Um, first experiences um, using Tulsa. Um, uh, I mean, all of this came after some treatment and, you know, excision experiments showed that this actually can ablate tissue. Uh, but the big trial that I mentioned to you was the pivotal sort of whole gland trial. Um, now we're looking at some focal studies that are coming out. Some, there's an early German series of 20 men. Um, and, you know, again, uh, when you do focal therapy, you want to look at did they ablate what they said they ablated and what's happening elsewhere. Um, and 14 men agreed to a biopsy uh, after the focal ablation. Um, and four out of 14 were positive. So they still had a 29% rate of, of uh, cancer uh, in, um, in the treated area. Uh, four were out of field and two of these also were in field. So, you know, you, you still see that number of about a third of men not being completely treated, um, although few side effects. Um, the, there is a push now to be suggesting that this is treating not just prostate cancer, but if we're ablating the prostate, why not make this a treatment for BPH? And all I would say to that is that we have so many other technologies for BPH that don't really cause incontinence or impotence. Again, one would argue Tulsa doesn't really either, uh, certainly not over the long term, but it, it does take an MRI block of time. And I think there are events like stricture, for example, uh, uh, that one can see at same rates as some of the other treatments for VPH. Um, it could be a competitor for it, but I don't think that's really where I see it uh, 
its primary you know, focus. Um, Dr. Dora down at Mayo uh, Jacksonville did a systematic review of Tulsa, and he showed uh, that, that if you look at these curves, you have planned ablation fraction on the x-axis, and um, uh, salvage free on the y-axis at the left, and potency preservation y-axis on the right. And you know, the more the prostate you ablate, essentially the more you get some ED, and, and uh, uh, the more prostate you ablate, slightly, to some extent, you get uh, better salvage free rates. So, so you know, the amount of prostate that you do on the 360 degrees will certainly affect your outcomes, but certainly very good um, uh, primary treatment outcomes uh, at, at two years, only 10% on salvage therapy, almost all are pad free, and you know, 75 to 98% are potent. So if you chose, choose your ablation well, you should have good outcomes. Um, they're trying some salvage Tulsa. Um, again, this is all very preliminary. Uh, very few papers looking at this so far, like one is an abstract. But oncologic efficacy at one year, you had about 11% uh, in-field recurrences and 22% out-of-field cancer is still there. So, you know, it's, it's a therapy. Um, but however, if you look at safety and quality of life, after using Tulsa to salvage radiation failure, you had a 50% incontinence rate. That's as bad as if you did a salvage prostatectomy. Um, there were some grade three adverse events. I'd say severe GU toxicity in 28%, and most of those were the ones who had whole gland salvage Tulsa. So I would say, as a, in summary, high incontinence rates, severe AEs, GU toxicities, particularly in whole gland. Again, whole gland is maybe not where this technology is headed. I think focal therapy, and there'll be a whole other session in focal therapy, is where this can shine. But it was put out there, and most of their data are on whole gland, so that's what there is to talk about. Um, ongoing, so I can't say much about this, but know that there is a randomized trial of whole gland Tulsa versus radical prostatectomy. It's called customized ablation of the prostate, so there, it's being pitched as not whole gland, but one can, you're supposed to sort of go 360 degrees around, but you can customize it and maybe not treat as much towards the nerve bundle on one side or spare some anterior tissue on another if the biopsies don't show cancer there in order to maintain some structure to the uh, prostate and uh, you know bladder neck and, and try to minimize any collateral damage to things like nerves and sphincter and, and bladder. Uh, but it's essentially whole gland Tulsa versus prostatectomy and we'll see where that's going. They're looking at endpoints like one year safety and three year efficacy for treatment free of uh, salvage therapy. Uh, so in summary, you know, again, this is a big deal. It's, you have to have three physicians typically under anesthesia in an MRI, rotating applicator. Um, the effectiveness can be hampered by very large glands because you're bleeding from this urethra out, and anything beyond about three centimeters is tough to reach. Um, calcifications are a problem, so you get a non-con CT to make sure they don't have them. As primary therapy, you know, the data at five years um, and focal data from small centers suggests safety minimal complications, excellent continence. But again, oncologic outcomes, you, you, you know, you have to position this that fewer side effects, but higher recurrence rates. Um, and even salvage can be effective, but again, probably not as a whole, whole gland salvage. Um, we are gonna do this, the CAPTAIN trial is accruing, uh, focal trials are underway, um, and I guess as the indications for surveillance are, uh, continues to expand, trials comparing active surveillance for intermediate risk patients versus a focal customized Tulsa to the area where the main sentinel cancer is would seem to be a priority. Some trials in progress, and I know there's more discussion of that at, later in this conference. Thank you.